China has a plan to conquer the high seas. Can the U.S. stop it before it's too late? Welcome back to China Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. Joining me today is Captain Jim Fennell, the former Director of Intelligence and Information Operations for the U.S. Pacific Fleet. That's the U.S. Navy. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Chris. Happy to be here. So China <clears throat> is talking about uh, these blue economic passages. And according to Chinese state-run media, these are harmless ocean trade routes that will connect Oceania and Africa and Europe. So is that really true? Are they harmless? It sounds really benign, but uh, I think it's not just an economic uh, development of the extension into the maritime domain of their Belt and Road Initiative. I think it's part of a larger strategy that China has for returning and, uh, China to its, what they believe is their rightful role and place in the, in the world, uh, their great rejuvenation and the achievement of the China dream. So are we talking imperial ambitions here? It, it kind of, to say that it comes across as conspiracy theory, but uh, it, it certainly seems like that's the seeds of what they're sowing today. And, and they've been working on for the last few years, at least in the South Pacific. I know you were recently in the South Pacific. What did you see there? Uh, what we saw was uh, we went to Kiribati and the Solomon Islands and Bougainville. And what we saw was in at least those first two countries, uh, 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 their governments had switched recognition from uh, Taipei to Beijing, uh, diplomatic recognition. These are tiny island nations. In They're the atoll South nations in the, in the Melanesian and Polynesian and Micronesian area of the South Pacific. And uh, they've switched their recognition right after, you know, the Chinese apparently have paid off a few of their members of parliament mm -hmm. and uh, bribed some people and attempted to bribe others. And so it seemed, and then come in with uh, big, you know, uh, infrastructure packages and, and purchases uh, to try to uh, essentially tell the locals in these areas, if you, if you align with us, you'll make yourselves rich. So what did you see on the ground in places like the Solomon Islands or Kiribati? Like, how are the people reacting to this? Uniformly, the people in Kiribati and, and the Solomon Islands, uh, the sense that we got was that they felt like they had been betrayed by their governments and not consulted. Uh, we talked to one dear lady in T uh, Tulagi, uh, who is in that society, they have matrilineal uh, ownership of the land. So she was a landowner and a uh, very nice woman. And she was, said, you know, we were betrayed. We weren't consulted. This is not a decision that we agree with. And we heard the same things in Guadalcanal and in, in, in some of the parts of Kiribati. Bougainville hasn't gotten to that quite step yet, but clearly they, their sentiments were, in terms of principles and the things that they believe in, they're more aligned to our way of thinking and the Western democracies than they are with, I mean, we heard they said, we're not communists, we don't like communism. Hmm. But if they offer us money, you know, well, if nobody else offers us anything, then it's that's what we're going to have to do. But in terms of their, their the, in Kiribati and the Solomons, it, it was very clear that they felt like these people had taken these bags of money in the middle of the night and then changed the vote. And, and now I even heard this morning from a contact in the Solomons that there's a little bit of buyer's remorse going on. Really? Yeah. That so, happened fast. Yeah. Because there was talk before uh, these agreements that, oh man, once the Chinese come in, we're all going to, you know, check your bank account. It's gonna, you're going to have thousands in, there, in your bank account and it really hasn't materialized yet. Well, I see how that's a problem for Taiwan, but is that really bad? China's giving these places that are very poor all this economic development. Uh, how do you argue against that? Well, on the face of it, it wouldn't seem bad, and it's actually for some of the local nations. If, if nobody else is going to help them, then why not accept uh, these kind of offers? Because they're, some of the places are in destitute poverty. Uh, but the concern that we should have is that these islands uh, and their geog strategic geographic location present uh, the same kind of challenge that we saw 80 years ago uh, when Japan took all these islands through military force. Mm -hmm. So China is using a different model right now, which is to come in with soft power and economic power and diplomatic power. You know, part of it is designed to isolate Taiwan, but part of it is to extend this, essentially what I called an iron bar through the South Pacific, and it would s essentially separate Australia and New Zealand from the rest of the world. Uh, now, as an American, maybe some people would say, what do we care if Australia and New Zealand are isolated? How do we get our Vegemite? Exactly. 
and uh, you know kangaroos. How will we see kangaroos? So there's there's an issue there, uh, but there's a larger strategic issue, which is to say that in the event of a, a crisis or a, a concern that America would have in the region, uh, we would need to have some kind of basing uh, for military forces like we did in World War II, and Australia and New Zealand present that as an option for us. So from a purely military standpoint, having Australia and New Zealand cut off uh, makes it much harder for us to deal with defending Taiwan or defending Japan from Chinese aggression uh, in a, in a, in a, a large-scale conflict. So China is essentially extending its control of the Pacific region. Yeah, they're cement, this is cementing their position in. But If they are able to establish these line of, of islands that are aligned to them diplomatically and then in the future allow them to bring in uh, military forces. So you think military is what comes next? Not the next step. I mean, I think the next step is, is you're going to see much more presence of their fishing fleet because mm. uh, China needs to feed their population. And this waters of the five degrees north, five degrees south of the equator is called the tuna belt. And there's a lot of tuna there that uh, helps feed people. And these are prime waters. And these small island nations can't control their exclusive economic zones because they just don't have large navies and they don't have satellites and things to know who's in their water poaching. So I think the Chinese, will, when they come in with their fishing fleets, they'll also bring their uh, State Oceanic Administration and the uh, Co Chinese Coast Guard and the People's Armed Forces Maritime Militia. Th this will all be brought in together and part of the package will be hey, we'll help you surveil, uh, surveil your EEZ to make sure that other countries aren't poaching, which, you know, uh, it's a kind of, it'll be a smooth way they do that. But that, once they start information sharing with these nations, it'll, it'll be another layer of entrenchment. And so it seems like in the very near term, this is actually going to hurt the people of these island nations because they're going to be short of fish. I think what'll happen is, is that China will be smart about it and they'll probably help them build fish, fish canneries and in ports and things of that nature. And they'll probably give them a slice of the, of, of the profit or in some sense. So there'll probably be a boost initially in money. Uh, but it won't be the full amount of, uh, of the resources that, that these nations, if they could develop them themselves in a free and open and transparent commercial uh, opportunity, uh, could reap in the long term. So at what point do you think the Chinese Navy would get involved? Well, we've already seen reports of Chinese uh, naval vessels making trips down to Australia and New Zealand. We've had reports in the last couple of years of Chinese uh, long-range aircraft uh, flying out of the south of China, southern China, into the Philippines and refueling and then going on down to, to New Zealand. So, uh, I, I mean, I'm not, sh I'm not saying that there's going to be military aircraft flying in and out of uh, Guadalcanal and Honoria and things of that nature in the next couple of years, but the idea is that they're setting the seeds for these infrastructure projects that would allow them to build ports. And the, if they do like they did in Vanuatu, they build this 800 you know, uh, meter long pier for a small country that didn't really need it. Well, what could go in there? And as I think 60 Minutes Australia reported last year, I mean, you could put an air, a Chinese aircraft carrier in there easily. So China's trying to develop its own uh, blue ocean capabilities? Well, they, ha they have been developing their own blue, blue water ocean capabilities for the last decade. Uh, and this is just another place where it can be expanded into. So I know some people would say, what's the difference between the U.S. Navy ruling the oceans versus the Chinese Navy ruling the ocean? What would you say to that? Uh, I would say that our Navy doesn't bully and harass people and, uh, you know, take their islands, their, their territory and their exclusive economic zone like China did with Scarborough Shoal in 2012, or build seven islands down in the Spratly Islands and in, inside the exclusive economic zone in Malaysia and the Philippines and Vietnam. Uh, they haven't, I mean, there's been reports of Chinese actors in South Laconia Shoal blowing up things and you know, taking their markers that say this is a Malaysian atoll and blowing it up so then they can put in a Chinese flag. So that's, those are just random examples. There's other examples where the Chinese are challenging people, military air, uh, ships like in the Taiwan Strait saying we, you can't travel through the Taiwan Strait. Everyone in the world knows that's an international passage, yet China wants to say that you can't go through there unless you ask my permission. So that kind of attitude in their their uh, response to the International Court of, uh, or the Permanent Court of Arbitration case in 2016 where they said this is a farce and we're not going to follow the court's ruling. 
these are all signals of uh, an attitude that says we get to do whatever we want. And then let me ask, just add one more. We also have these cases of uh, U.S. and other aircraft being lazed out in Djibouti and in the East and South China Sea by Chinese Chinese uh, vessels, uh, Chinese forces. So lazed is like uh, shining a laser in a pilot's eyes is uh, only one one reason you do that to blind the guy and then then he crashes and dies. So it's a very serious uh, provocation, and we kind of haven't held them accountable for that. So, so how much of a concern is this actually? Because can the Chinese Navy really rival the United States? Well, I, as I've said in other forums, I think the Chinese Navy does rival the U.S. Navy inside the, the Asia-Pacific, you know, inside the second island chain in terms of uh, the number of platforms that they have that can shoot missiles to sink our fleet. Uh, Anti-ship cruise missiles from the surface ships, from their submarines, from their aircraft, um, land-based uh, cruise missiles, land, land-based uh, ballistic missiles that are designed to kill carriers like the DF-21 and DF-26. So China's built a layered uh, defensive uh, capability to keep the U.S. military at arm's length from the Taiwan contingency, the Senkaku's contingency, and any contingency in the South China Sea. I think what we're going to see over the next decade is them extend that counter-intervention strategy beyond the second island chain. So really keep American forces from even getting from Hawaii into the Guam area. Also, what would that mean for the world if the U.S. is denied access to basically the entire Western Pacific? Well, it, it, it would be denied in a, in a conflict. Uh, on a daily basis, it wouldn't mean anything initially. But in the event of a conflict where China said we want to you know, we're tired of America or we don't like what they did with Hong Kong, uh, act, the act that the Congress passed and the president signed, uh, where they say that's, you know, unacceptable and we're going to show you, they could block off something or they could isolate something or they can conduct a, uh, a quarantine or a, a blockade of, of, of some place and, you know, essentially starve somebody out if they wanted to. And we'd be hard pressed to break that without, you know, escalating the situation. So they could use it as a is a is a, a ratcheting up technique, mm. a, a part of the salami slicing strategy that we haven't really seen. We've seen them incrementally inch forward in in geographic areas, and, and, and statements and postures, but we haven't actually seen them do it in the like in a military, more militaristic way. Well, I know these uh, blue economic passages. It's not just in the South Pacific. It's also going up to the Arctic. It's going to Europe, to Africa. What's happening in those other branches of this? Well, we're seeing, I mean, they've really been focused. The first one was from the South China Sea into the Indian Ocean and then up into the Mediterranean and then the Baltic. I was up on a ship in the Baltic, a Chinese ship that's, they routinely send ships up there, exercise with the Russians up there. So they've made inroads into Europe. Uh, uh, you know, Xi has been uh, meeting with the French and the Italians and they've signed some agreements for the Belt and Road Initiative and ports in Genoa, ports in Trieste. Uh, I expect to see more ports in France come under some kind of a, an agreement. I wouldn't be surprised if that would happen. You have the base in Djibouti. Remember, for years they said we don't have it. We're never going to have any overseas military bases. I mean, you can pull out, you can pull out, you know, reams and reams of analysis from think tanks in this town that said that would never happen, and yet there it sits. So what else are we seeing that they're doing on the west coast of Africa, down on the east coast of South America and Argentina and Brazil? Uh, where else are they expanding so that they can have the presence to be able to operate? I, th I think it's coming, and we've just been reluctant to predict the future, even though they tell us what it is. Yeah, I was thinking that a lot of the things the Chinese Communist Party is doing in like the Solomon Islands, it sounds very similar to Mauritania and the Western Africa. Same fishing thing, same It's a It's a model. They have a model, and uh, it seems to be pretty effective. So what, what does all this mean for your average American? Well, what it means is at the end of the day, if you don't address this in another 20 years, 30 years, by 2049, China will have established a system of governance that will allow Beijing and the Chinese Communist Party to control the levers of, of power. And what it will mean in real terms is instead of having the market dictate uh, how how many iPhones we make or how many cars we build or how many jackets we buy or how many shoes we have made, you're going to have some bureaucrat in Beijing 
you know, doing a scientific development process on his abacus, telling us, okay, this is, this, is the, this is the goal. We need to produce this many of these and this many of these and this many of these. And, and then there's another segment of the government that's reviewing the people in other places and saying, uh-oh, that guy, you know, he forgot to, you know, do this and he didn't do that, so we're going to lower his score and he can't travel anymore or his kid can't get into this university or he can't get this kind of a... Uh, uh, you know, uh, goat cheese at this store because, you know, he's had too much in the last three months. So this is the kind of world that sounds crazy, but this is the way they want to control things. The social credit system. The social credit system. I mean, you can just imagine that being exported. Even though they deny that they want to export it, uh, it seems pretty clear that if you're going to e expand your belt and road and have all this control everywhere, uh, that you're not going to, you, you, your system can't work. You know, they talk about the, they're, you know, they're pushing forward into AI and big data. They want the, all this data to come in. Well, what for? If it's for only, only for market forces? No, it's going to be more than that. Mm. So what can the U.S. do about this? Well, we first have to do what I think this administration has done is recognize that China is a strategic competitor. So we've said that in the national security strategy and the national defense strategy. Uh, and now we're starting to have uh, our senior leaders talk about the difference between uh, the United States and China and PRC in terms of their values I and mean, what we stand for in individual liberty and freedom, uh, whereas the Chinese Communist Party stands for the Chinese Communist Party. And so they are the be-all, end-all of everything. And uh, it, we, need to, we need to tell the world that there's a choice there. Now, I know that the administration, some people have said, well, we're not asking people to make choices between U.S. and the PRC. And that's a, that's a fine thing. I think what we're doing is saying you have to decide about the values, though, who you want to be associated with. And I think that we have a long track record uh, in human history that our system of, 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 uh, of freedom is more attractive and more appealing to people innately and it gives people a better opportunity to, to have a higher quality of life and more satisfaction. Uh, that message needs to be continued. On a defense uh, security standpoint, we need to retool our military to move it away from a focus on the Middle East to a focus on uh, you know, being able to keep the sea lanes open and trade and economies going. So as much as people say you know, the administration is isolationist, I don't see that because they say they want to build up the Navy. Uh, it just uh, in Simi Valley yesterday or the day before, the new National Security Advisor O'Brien talked about the, the administration's commitment to getting to a 350-ship Navy, not in decades, but sooner than that. So there's a desire by the administration to build up the Navy, and there's only one reason for that. And the re reason that we want a big Navy is to ensure that the Chinese or then the, the, the Russians and the Soviet Navy don't control these things and, and put a damper on international trade in, in, in between these nations. So I think we're on the right track. I just think it's really hard to move the ship of state. Uh, and we have a lot of commitments globally. And we've had a mindset since uh, Desert Storm, since 1991, that has said, you know, the Middle East is an existential threat. And I think that things in the Middle East are dangerous. Uh, but I, I, I think that after 30 years and the infrastructure that we've established with the Homeland Security and other places, it'll allowed us to say, okay, we've got, we've got a handle on the Middle East and terrorism uh, bef much better than we did before 9-11. Um, but what we don't have a handle on right now is competing and being able to deter Chinese aggression in the Indo-PACOM arena. And, and, and I, I'm concerned that if we don't address it now, we won't be able to address it when it concerns in the Mediterranean or the South Atlantic. Well, so what happens in the next five or ten years after this administration? Well, this is American domestic politics. I mean, you need sustainment of this uh, view of uh, if you you know if you buy into this. I mean, I, I recognize that many people may not, but I think a lot of obviously the administration does, and there seems to be you hear reports about bipartisan agreement on things like the Hong Kong Act and, and other things like that. The Uyghur that. Bill. The Uyghur Bill, yeah, exactly. So we need to, we need to capitalize on this, uh, this emerging bipartisan, bipartisan efforts towards China, and it needs to be sustained. So you say a lot of these, these island nations, they share the same values as the United States. Uh, but, I mean, as you say, values 
don't pay the bills? What, what can be done on the ground? So I, I think uh, the administration is moving out in certain areas and trying to incentivize, uh, you know, our commercial interests to, to help in these areas. And they're, 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 they've got a number of things that they're working on. But from my perspective, this is a big issue. And all these islands have similar problems in terms of infrastructure and being able to monitor their EEZs and to reap the harvest of the resources that they have, whether in the water or on their islands. And they need help. And what the United States should do with, I think, four other nations, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and Taiwan, is to band together and develop some kind of what I would term a Marshall Plan, find some you know, person, I don't, I, I don't know if it's preferably a military person, but maybe you need somebody that's going to be able to lead a large group like this, but to have these nations come together and do something outside of their typical bureaucratic morass and break above that to say, hey, we're in a cri kind of a crisis like we were in World War II where Germany was devastated, the Soviets were pressing in, and these people needed food, they needed, they needed sustenance, they needed infrastructure, and George Marshall, the general of the army, developed a plan to come in and help rescue them. And some of it was we brought in our own stuff and our own food and things of that nature, but it was also coming in and helping the German people just have the uh, ability to rise, rise themselves up and, and rebuild Germany. The Germans did that, okay? We could do something similar in this area here, which would just moving in that direction, labeling it and moving in that direction uh, and combining the, the, the talents of our five nations, you know, maybe the Japanese build harbors, maybe the, the Australians take roads, maybe the, you know, the U.S. does IT, whatever it is, but something like that where we're all kind of covering a wedge, uh, covering an area that then could then show and demonstrate not only to these, well, first to these islands that, hey, you know, the Western world is really here and they, they're doing it again like they did 80 years ago. They're coming to help us. And then we need to train them. We don't just need to give them fish. We need to train them to learn how to fish. And uh, that's nothing new for me, but you've heard that. And we should be doing that across all these areas. And then it also sends a larger signal to the rest of Asia, which is to say, hey, you know, America said they're committed to the Pacific. They say they're a Pacific nation. Here they're actually doing something and it's helping people. Uh, I think this is a way to help answer that question about why should I choose the PRC or why should I choose the U.S.? Why should I choose the Chinese Communist Party or why should I choose freedom? So, but this is not an easy thing to do and uh, the bureaucracies in each of our governments are very difficult because we have established protocols and concerns and, you know, there's concerns about, well, we're not going to spend as much money dollar for dollar against China. We're not going to compete in that arena. And I'm not suggesting that we compete dollar for dollar. What I'm suggesting is we compete idea for idea, innovation versus some, somebody in the Chinese Communist Party with a schedule that's figured out, okay, here's, here's how we can do this. And we're going to mandate it down to them. I think we can do this. We just need to say it's important. So with everything you're saying about China's uh, global ambitions, doesn't this come from Xi Jinping? Like, he won't be in power forever. Like, maybe after Xi Jinping, it won't be as much of an issue. Yeah, so I think there's a, 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 a school of thought inside the China hands community that, that's focusing on Xi and kind of blaming Xi as the cause, root cause of what's going on right now. And that the Belt and Road and this economic passages and the militarization of the Chinese uh, is all because of Xi and what he's doing in Xinjiang, all these things that we track, that you track and your team. Uh, but the re well, my, my, my belief is, and my, what I've seen from the evidence is, is that this blue economic passages, they predate Xi. Mm -hmm. They go back to, I saw pictures on Chinese warships from 2012 that depicted a dragon's head coming out of the mainland of China with three arrows, one to the the, the polar area, one into the South China Sea, into the Indian Ocean, and one into the South Pacific. That was on a Chinese warship in Cindy, Sydney in 2012. Okay? That was to inspire Chinese sailors to be pumped up about their mission. Okay? Well, those pictures were probably developed in 2011 or 2010, you know, well before Xi Jinping was in power. So my, my, my belief is, is that this is part of the long 
trajectory that's unbroken since Deng, Zhang, Hu, Xi, and whoever's next. They're all marching towards to return China to its rightful place in, in charge of the world. So this isn't Xi Jinping, this is an existential threat of the Chinese Communist Party. Correct. Now Xi is, you know, chosen to break with past practice of how you expose yourself, at least the Chinese Communist Party being exposed for their truer intentions. Uh, so maybe he, maybe he stepped off too early, we can debate that. But clearly, he's not the only guy that's doing this. And when he goes away, it, it's not going to change that trajectory. They're still going to be intent upon that. So they haven't been deterred is the, the real issue. We've had 40 years of engagement that has told them, yeah, we're not going to do anything, so do whatever you want. That's got to change. All right. Thank you very much for joining me today. It's a pleasure Great. to have you on. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it.